Thank you. This is as close to a rock star as I'll ever get. I don't have a guitar with me here, but I wish I did. I'm, I'm a very bad a musician. Um, who am I? I am a uh, president of Pellegrino and Associates. It's an IP valuation firm. I'm a computer scientist turned finance and accountant, which is a euphemism for a guy who didn't date a lot in high school. So we see a lot of ideas. Some of them are off the wall. Some of them, I've had calls to value communism. I've had calls to value soft core pornography, bestsellers, condoms, everything in between. In the context of what we're talking about today, it's IP, intellectual property. It's generally patents, copyrights, trademarks, trade secrets. The theme is green, so we're going to talk about how to make green money with green technologies. About IP, IP in my view, is uh, incredible. It has this amazing ability to create wealth that is not correlated to the inputs of production. It's not, wealth is not related to how many hours I work or how much land I own or how much energy I produce or things like that. It's more closely related to pain points that I address in the market and the market reach. Now this is an important thing when you're thinking about how do you make green with green. How much wealth is it? It's trillions of dollars on an annual basis, trillions. And um, in my experience, many ideas are worth more than standalone companies. So let's talk a little bit about green ideas. I see a lot of them. I've seen fuels made out of algae. I've seen sludge turned into syngas. I've seen um, all sorts of different alchemy. The idea is to create something that's going to be more environmentally friendly. So it falls generally into a couple of uh, broad buckets. It might be food, it might be energy, wind power, solar power, waste recovery, electric vehicles, pollution controls, a lot of different things there. And it touches on every major uh, area of the, uh, the science um, uh, spectrum. So everything from physics and chemistry to software, uh, semiconductors, even business processes and patents. So the promise of these green ideas is that by using these ideas we better marshal scarce natural resources and the other promise is that by using these ideas we reduce the environmental impacts of human existence so can I do something and reduce my footprint and create less collateral damage just by living the reality of the situation and, and I'm not one to, to uh, uh, wax philosophy on whether it's right or wrong, I'm just going to tell you what it is and how, what my experiences are, is that the economic considerations are going to uh, prevail. So you can talk about uh, what the impact might be on polar bears uh, or what the impact might be on uh, uh, deforestation in Indonesia and that might uh, rank second to the impact of uh, somebody eating uh, uh, versus deforesting uh, in Indonesia. So what we find is the reality is that many green ideas are duds. Uh, which is not really the thing you want to say at a green conference, but that's the reality of the situation. So I will give you some insights into the heuristics that give you some better understanding of what are going to be green ideas that are also not duds. So ultimately we find that there's a lot of expensive research projects with few practical outputs. There are heuristics that make ideas that are green valuable. The first is it actually solves a real problem. Not a perceived problem, but a real problem. The second, and this is a very important one, is that the marginal cost of the alternatives is less than the cost of what you're replacing. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. The next is that it applies to a broad sector of the population. Because that's really where you start to get the environmental impact. You, you, you get it disseminated across a wide uh, reach of audiences. The fourth is it does not depend on government intervention because that usually mucks it up and, and really you get a, a variety of uh, uh, selfish parties that start uh, creating rules to their advantage as opposed to what's actually uh, to the benefit of uh, the ultimate movement, kind of what we saw this morning with Colin's talk. And the last is, uh, and this is a hard one too, it does not require a substan substantial change in behavior and um, that is usually a, a major deterrent for the adoption of valuable green technologies. There are others of course, these are some of the headline ones. So let's test the thesis. We have 
four things that we're going to test against that framework. And the results might be a little bit surprising, but they're certainly borne out in the experiences I've had as a valuation guy in the last 12 years looking at a lot of these sorts of things. We'll look at solar power, electric vehicles, living closer to your job, and an efficient way to sort auto fluff, which is just residue when you're done uh, uh, sorting cars. And you, you, you shredded your car, and you're sorting all the materials out. Solar power. So first question is, is there an acute pain point that it solves? The reality, no. Because we have inexpensive power all over the place. Whether it's coal, or it's hydroelectric, or, uh, I mean, there's a lot of merit in oil, regardless of the environmental impact. For the same reasons we use oil today, we don't slaughter whales and use them to light our houses, because the marginal cost of it is remarkably low. As it relates to solar, the marginal cost of production of power using solar is more expensive. And certainly if you look at the total environmental impact, manufacturing semiconductors is not necessarily green technology. It's actually rather uh, horrible <laughs> from an environmental standpoint because of all the acids and other things that are required to do it. Does it apply to a, apply to a broad uh, population? And the answer here is no, because the general population is going to lack the space for solar panels and they're certainly not going to have the money to invest. You want to outfit a house in the uh, United States with tax incentives and whatnot, you're looking at about $30,000. Now, the median household income in the U.S. is around $50,000 to $60,000, depending on the state. So you're talking half a year's salary to put solar panels on your house. That's not going to be affordable. Uh, it does not depend on government intervention. So few projects uh, in, in solar exist, exist without um, uh, that government subsidy. And the last is doesn't require a significant change of behavior, and solar doesn't work at night. So we still need a base load power uh, that we have to address. Next is electric vehicles. Um, kind of ironic, I didn't know they were doing a Tesla rally here. Mind you, it's a beautiful car. <laughs> and this is not targeted toward Tesla specifically, it's targeted to a lot of different electric vehicle initiatives. But what we find, again, actual pain point that it solves, it's not there. There's a variety of uh, uh, alternate transportation, everything from walking and bicycles to cars of, of a variety of different forms and public transportation and so forth. Uh, the next is uh, marginal cost of alternatives. Uh, are they more expensive or less expensive? Well, I could buy a VW Golf TDI uh, for about $25,000 and, and get incredible performance out of that vehicle and for the, for the energy input that's going into it. And uh, you know, so the, that's just one example, but there's a lot of alternatives that are a lot less expensive than the equivalently equipped vehicle. Uh, the next is, does it apply to the broad population? I use U.S. statistics here because I know them the best. The number one and number three vehicles that sell in the U.S. are pickup trucks, the Ford F-150 and the Chevy Silverado. You're talking about more than a half a million vehicles just in those two models. A widely successful EV project is going to sell around 20,000 cars to 30,000 cars in a year. So we're not even talking 8%. Uh, um, does it depend on government uh, uh, intervention in some form of subsidies? Absolutely. Some of the largest buyers of EVs in the U.S. are actually fleet buyers from governments. The last is, does it require a significant change in human behavior? The answer is yes. You've got to have infrastructure, you've got range anxiety, am I going to run out of power? You've got issues with temperature and how long the battery's going to last in the winter with the headlights on and the stereo going versus the summer. Uh, so it's not an issue if you don't live in New York City, uh, but if you live in New York City, and one of my clients was Con Ed and they had a bunch of EVs, they used to send a tow truck out for them all the time. Because they're stuck in traffic, they run the battery out, and now they can't run anywhere. Gasoline, by the way, is really efficient. I can carry 100 kilowatts of power under my arm. That's three gallons of gasoline. It's amazing. How about living closer to work? In the U.S., the average commute might be around 20, 25 minutes, which if you're doing highway speed is 20 miles. That's a long way. So living closer to work, does it, have a, does it solve an acute pain point? The answer is yes. Reduce transportation costs. Carbon footprint is smaller. The commute time is less. How about the marginal costs of, of alternatives? The answer here again, yes. Commutes are costly costs billions of dollars a year to commute. So does it apply to a broad sector of the population? Of course. So we get scale out of it, which means it could be an economic uh, uh, winner at a macro level. Does it depend on government intervention? Generally speaking, no. So because unless there's exceptional circumstances, there are a few practical restrictions to living closer to uh, your, your work, unless you want to live next to a nuclear power plant. Some people might not want to do that. 
Does it require significant change in behavior? Maybe, maybe not. Depends where you live. If you live in New York City, probably not. Not a lot of folks own cars there. If you live in uh, Paducah, Kentucky, it's probably a problem if you're going to be driving to an automobile plant to manufacture cars. How about an efficient way to sort auto fluff? That's what happens when you shred a car and you basically separate the metals, the steel, the aluminum, the plastics, and all of that, and, uh, and, and then send it off to be reprocessed and manufactured into new cars. So this is a true project. It's a client of mine. Uh, basically, what they're trying to figure out how to do is recycle higher amounts of copper from shredded automobiles. So it generates revenue. That's the end goal for them. They get, it's a green technology because you're recycling. The marginal costs are greater because you have to landfill all of that, and you've got manual labor costs to sort all of it if you didn't want to do that. And the volume of material is just too large. You can't do it. Does it apply to a broad part of the population? And the answer here, yeah, it works for every vehicle that's out there. So anywhere you've got an auto shredder in the world, you have a technology that's going to be relevant and works. Does it depend on government invention, intervention? Absolutely not. In this particular case, this technology uh, had no government influence at all. It actually uh, it helps people uh, comply with environmental regulations. And the last is, does it require a change in human behavior? I don't think a single person in this room is affected directly by what happened with this particular technology. So it bolts onto existing equipment, so the pain point was low. So that heuristic that I talked about earlier, we're meeting that. So when we test the results, and I'm not a partisan on this, I'm just looking at it from my own experience of solar power, not scalable, and it's not a valuable green idea. And you can see that by looking at the rate of bankruptcies in the solar companies and the rate of profitability in those, uh, especially for the publicly traded companies. How about electric vehicles? Same outcome. Had a lot of bankruptcies. Indiana, where I live, had a lot of uh, EV uh, initiatives in the last couple of years and a lot of bankruptcies that came out of that. Even the uh, arguably the most successful EV company out there today, Tesla, has lost $1.3 billion so far. If you look at their most recent quarter. How about living closer to your job? You know, it, it seems like a, a novel thing, and, and in Hong Kong, that's not a hard thing to do, but in other areas where you're more geographically dispersed, it's a lot harder to do. But it's very scalable, and it turns out it's very valuable. But the only problem is it, it requires some change in behavior and other things like that, so it's not as popular as what we might see. A better way to sort auto fluff. Very scalable, and it, it turns out it's a very green idea, and it's incredibly valuable. One of the most valuable uh, uh, th ideas I've ever looked at as a valuation guy. And I didn't really appreciate how valuable it was until I missed a flight and this guy sent a private jet to pick me up. First time I ever did it, only time I've ever done it, but uh, I think he spent more on jet fuel than he did to pay me to look at this thing. But uh, the point is that uh, it was an incredibly uh, valuable technology for those reasons. So the closer here, and I have a second closer, valuable green ideas are not always as they seem. There's a certain pattern associated with them. You fit that pattern, you're going to be remarkably successful, and, and if wealth is the measure of some of that success, you're going to be remarkably wealthy as well. But it requires a uh, consideration of a variety of different economic forces as well as human forces. You can't look at each of them in a vacuum. Interesting observation that I've had in many ways, the world was much greener 100 years ago. Now, why is that? Because the marginal cost of energy was a lot higher than it is today. So we used to wash bottles. You worked in a store. You had your apartment right above it. All right, so we've got about a minute left. I was asked to give a reprise of a story I had last uh, night in, a, in an event. So I'm a brand valuation guy, too. So I don't only look at technologies. I look at brands and trademarks. So a very popular brand is Tiffany's. Now, I'm a guy who's very frugal. I don't spend a lot of money on brands and whatnot. But what I wound up doing one year is I bought my wife something from Tiffany's. And what I found is that, um, you know, that blue box has an emotive response to it that is disproportionate to the amount of money that you spend on it, whatever's in that box. So I bought this little bracelet from my wife. I put it in the box. I wrapped it up. They open it at Christmas, and I'm getting all these oohs and ahs. You bought me Tiffany's? Mr. Cheapskate, the guy who doesn't buy branded anything, buys me Tiffany's. So I am here. I am the best husband on the planet for this. She opens the second thing. She sees another bit of that blue, that turquoise blue. And she's, I'm, again, I'm, I'm a hero for uh, the husband of the year, if you will, because I bought two things from Tiffany's. 
And then within about 30 seconds, you can literally see my wife's face change from delight to contempt. Because I'm a brand valuation guy, I know what I bought. I bought a box with Tiffany's, that blue box, but I also, it came with a bag. And I wrapped that bag up. And so for about 30 seconds, I was the best husband on the planet because I got the emotive response of two things from Tiffany's. Until she realized that that second thing was an empty bag. In which case, uh, I got the maximum value that I could out of that, uh, that brand and that experience, but um, you know, probably not the best husband for it. So uh, that's uh, everything that I can tell you in 15 minutes on IP valuation. Thanks so much for your time today.